The US Navy is selling six literal combat ships, for Freedom Class and two Independence Class, which are brand new and no more than eight years old. However, few countries are interested in buying them, leading to a dismal state of the literal combat ship, which cost more than $37 billion. According to the US War Zone website, the US Navy plans to sell six literal combat ships, including for Freedom Class and two Independence Class ships, through the Foreign Military Sales FMS, program within the next two years. The four Freedom Class ships are the USS Wichita, USS Billings, USS Indianapolis, and USS St. Louis. The ships are scheduled to enter service in 2019 and 2020, respectively. The U.S. Navy plans to sell the four ships in 2025. The U.S. Navy plans to sell two literal combat ships, two Independence-class USS Jackson and USS Montgomery, commissioned in 2015 and 2016, respectively. The youngest ship, the USS St. Louis, is only three years old, and the oldest, the USS Jackson, is only eight years old. Why has the literal combat ship become a hot potato in the hands of the US Navy? To answer this question, we must first discuss the background of the development of these two ships. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s, the US Navy's combat mission was adjusted in the direction of sea to land and forward presence. The focus of operations shifted from controlling the sea to nearshore operations and supporting land-based operations. To put it bluntly, the USA is invincible, there is no one to fight on the vast ocean. In the absence of an opponent, the frequent deployment of traditional destroyers is a very expensive thing. For example, the annual operating cost of an Arleigh Burke-class destroyer is about $81 million. It's too expensive to use such a gold-devouring beast out and about every day. Moreover, in the implementation of the Sea Deterrence Mission, if an Arleigh Burke-class cannot solve the problem, it will certainly have to send out the carrier battle group. And if an Arleigh Burke can solve the problem, sending out a lower class warship can also solve it. Therefore, it is better to design a lower cost warship to replace the traditional destroyer for daily deterrence patrol missions. In September 1994, the US Navy adopted the surface combatant ship of the 21st century, SG-21, mission requirements program. The SG-21 was renamed the DD-21 in 1997. In November 2001, the US Navy released the Surface Combatant Ship Modernization Program, which planned to build three ships for entirely new mission requirements. These are the DD-X, a future destroyer primarily responsible for ground attack, the CG-X, a new generation cruiser primarily responsible for air defense, and the LCS, a literal combat ship for literal combat missions. The DD-X is the Jumwalt-class destroyer, of which only three were eventually built due to a reduction in the number of units built. The CG-X cruiser program was discontinued in 2011, and only the literal combat ship LCS is still under construction. The LCS is divided into two configurations, the Lockheed Martin Freedom Class Littoral Combat Ship and the General Dynamics Independence Class Littoral Combat Ship. This time some viewers will ask, the US military has always developed WIP is a brand new ship, and there was no direct reference in the design process. In the process of developing design tasks and requirements, the US Navy has studied a variety of surface ships, ranging from 400-ton patrol boats to 4,000-ton frigates. In June 2002, the U.S. Navy released the 21st World Navy, a new era of operations concept document, and the literal combat ship gradually evolved from a single type of ship classification to a separate ship type similar to destroyers and cruisers. As a separate ship type, of course, there will be different types of literal combat ships. So since the U.S. Navy has divided ships into two types, what is the difference between these two types? The Freedom Class and the Independence Class have similar performance indicators, but the biggest difference lies in the hull structure. The Liberty Class hull is a V-shaped semi-sliding monohull design, with the upper part tilted inward and the lower part retracted. The Independence Class is much more sci-fi in appearance, with a large deck design with three hulls running through the waves and the same width and inward angle of inclination. The Trimaran design makes the flight deck on the transom very wide, reaching more than 1,000 square meters. 
it is 2.5 times the maximum width of the hull of a frigate of the same displacement. It is even nearly one-third wider than the hull of a 7,000-ton destroyer. Can take off and land the CH-53 Super Stallion, a heavy shipboard helicopter. And unlike the traditional steel hull of the Freedom class, the hull of the Independence class is made of aluminum alloy. This was chosen primarily to provide a lightweight hull and welding performance. The aluminum alloy, however, was a potential problem for the subsequent service of the Independence class. We will talk about how serious this problem is later. As the US Navy's mission planning for the littoral combat ship is primarily a variety of low-intensity operations in enemy coastal waters, the mission is to deliver weapons and forces from sea to land. Therefore, the littoral combat ship has less firepower than traditional frigates, and its main outstanding performance is stealth and high speed. The maximum speed can reach 50 knots, faster than most missile boats. The biggest advantage of super high speed is initiative. High speed intervention, high speed transfer, and high speed disengagement. When intervening, the opponent's reaction time is significantly shortened, and when disengaging, the opponent cannot catch up, and the opponent can only respond passively without the ability to actively engage, which in effect increases survivability and tactical flexibility. So how is such a fast speed achieved? Simply put, the power is stacked. The literal combat ship, a ship of just over 3,000 tons, is equipped with two MT-30 gas turbines. You know this kind of power is enough to drive large destroyers weighing 10,000 tons. However, the US Navy has high hopes for the two ships, but not for the performance of a class of ships while in service and the decommissioning of the spectacle. The US Navy retired the early models before the literal combat ship was fully delivered, citing the high cost of upgrades and plans to sell off several active ships. So the question is, what went wrong with the literal combat ship, which the US Navy invested heavily in developing, so much so that it has become a hot potato in the hands of the US Navy? The first is the cost control problem. The US Navy originally planned to build the literal combat ship as a cheap workhorse that could be built in large numbers to take up the mantle of offshore combat. Just like the F-35 fighter aircraft, which is cheap and affordable, this type of multi-use. However, the actual cost of construction took off directly. Construction costs have risen from an early estimate of $220 million per ship to $655 million per ship. And, as previously stated, the aluminum hull of the Independence class is a major issue. How serious is this issue? It is so large that it costs $70 million per year. Why is this the case? Because, when compared to steel, aluminum alloy is a highly unstable and easily corroded metal. The original intention of using aluminum alloy for the Independence class was very good. It provides a lightweight hull and excellent weldability. The aluminum hull structure has the advantage of being able to withstand large underwater blast loads without losing the water tightness of the hull. Aluminum ships also have good ductility and can withstand great plastic deformation before the hull structure fractures. Naturally, general dynamics researchers are not stupid and know the defects of aluminum alloy materials. Used in the independent class are marine grade 5083 and 6082 aluminum alloys, which in theory have excellent corrosion resistance. The surface of the hull built with them does not need to be coated with corrosion protection. However, the theory is just a theory, and in actual use, the aluminum alloys are far from as strong as the theory suggests. Therefore, the daily maintenance of the independent class is particularly tedious, paying attention to the cleanliness of the cabin, air conditioning room, and other machinery premises. The accumulation of water or oil-based dirt and dust can lead to serious corrosion. Sometimes a small copper nut dropped in the bilge can also lead to localized corrosion or even perforation of the aluminum hull. And when the ship is docked at the pier, the bollard cannot use steel cable but synthetic fiber. It is not allowed to directly connect the hull to electricity as an anode during DC welding operations, otherwise, it will also lead to serious corrosion of the aluminum alloy hull and so on. This series of maintenance rules made it not only expensive to maintain but also a logistical nightmare. In fact, when the first ship of the Independence class was built, long cracks were found in the hull. After a visual dive inspection and ultrasonic testing in 2012, it was found that the water jet propulsion components had suffered severe current corrosion and pitting, 
requiring repair and replacement in dock. For this reason, on subsequent independent stages, the U.S. has used new anti-corrosion coating materials and added a current cathodic protection system. However, the actual results were not satisfactory. Nearly half of the 13 Independence-class ships currently in service still have cracks in their hulls. The consequence is that the U.S. Navy strictly prohibits them from traveling at speeds exceeding 15 knots in sea conditions with waves about 8 feet high to prevent the risk of spreading structural cracks. It is a dark joke that the literal combat ship, which is known for its high speed, is prohibited from traveling faster than 15 knots. The second is the United States' overarching strategic shift. At this point, the literal combat ship is no longer suited to the strategic needs of the United States Navy. Because the United States' main imaginary enemy possesses strong air and sea power as well as area denial capability, the United States Navy strategy has reverted to seizing sea and air power. Literal combat ships, which have sacrificed weaponry for stealth and speed, are typically useless in these missions. And in the offshore close-range reconnaissance of the enemy's mission, the literal combat ship is running faster than the emergence of a large number of ultra-high-speed anti-ship missiles. As long as the other side in the near sea found to face the risk of being anti-ship fire a wave away, the cost does not come down to maintenance and trouble but also cannot adapt to the strategic needs of the US Navy. The literal combat ship naturally falls into a category disliked by the US Navy. Then since the US Navy wants to sell it, the literal combat ship is more suitable for which countries? The United States had plans to sell it to South American countries or Middle Eastern countries. The reason is also very simple, this thing runs fast. It is simply tailor-made for anti-drug and anti-smuggling missions. Previously, it was revealed that the US military in Chile and Ecuador touted the news of the ship. However, the South American countries have reacted very little. After all, Although South America is the United States of America's backyard, South American countries are not fools. The literal combat ships cost about $500 million each and also need a lot of money to keep them seaworthy. The annual cost of running one is about $70 million, plus there will be high costs for repairs and refits. How can poor people afford that price? And of course, the US has touted the ship for Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia spent $11.2 billion on a contract to build four ships in 2019. But then let the Saudis continue to buy six estimates that are unrealistic. After all, anyone with a clear eye can see. The Saudi Arabian year this $11.2 billion to buy is not the literal combat ship. Rather, the protection money goes to the United States. In the case of Saudi Arabia and the United States, whose relationship is not very good, it is difficult to get Saudi Arabia to pay for the purchase. So the six literal combat ships to be sold to whom the problem is afraid that even the United States itself has not thought well. Well, this is the whole content of this issue. Which countries, in your opinion, would be good candidates to purchase the literal combat ship? Feel free to post your thoughts in the comments section. I'm FP Dense News and we'll see you next time.